welcome everyone. Thanks for being here on this Friday, the, the 29th of May, um, for the Renner Nation Training Series, uh, episode three. This is Why Do We Pay Rent, Land and Housing Under Capitalism. And uh, my name is Paige. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I live in Brooklyn, Lenape territory, and I work at Right to the City as a national organizer. And I'm going to pass it to my co-host, Maria, to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. Happy to be here with you all today. My name is Maria. I use she, her pronouns. I work at the Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco, and I am in Oakland, Ohlone Territory. Thanks for being here. Um, so before we get started, we just have a few housekeeping announcements. Uh, next slide. So uh, we have a practice of language justice in this space, and Spanish speakers can dial into the interpretation line if they need to. The Spanish audio is being recorded and it will be available afterwards. And if you are calling into the Spanish interpretation line, please put yourself on mute so that the interpreters are able to hear the presenters. Um, and you have the information here on the slide with the um, meeting ID if you need Spanish interpretation. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So some tech tips on engaging with a Zoom webinar. We're using the webinar function, so you won't be able to join your audio or video to the call, but you should be able to see and hear me and Maria, and you should also be able to access the chat box. And throughout the call, we encourage folks to share thoughts and questions using the chat box. And our chat box monitor will help uh, me and Maria track those comments. And um, to send messages to all the call attendees, you want to select all panelists and attendees from the chat box. There's a drop down menu in the text field that should be blue. And you want to click on that and select all panelists and attendees if you want to message everybody who is tuning in tonight. Uh, so go ahead and use the chat box to introduce yourself. You can share your name and where you're joining us from and why you're interested in this call. If you're part of an organization, you can share that with us as well. So go ahead and use the chat and tell us who's here. Just go ahead and share your name, where you're calling from, and why you're interested. I see Araceli from Casa Justa. I see folks from San Francisco in the Bay Area. Lexington, Kentucky, hey. Uh, Santa Ana, Seattle. New Virginia majority. Right on, oh, Portland, Oregon, Oregon, Virginia, Santa Cruz, right on. Um, so we're coast to coast tonight. Really excited to have you all here. Um, and we're gonna do a little bit of intro to who we are and what this call is. So can we go to the next slide? Oh, and I forgot to mention, we all are recording this call. So you'll get, um, a copy of the recording afterwards. Okay, so Right to the City. Um, I want to introduce us really quickly. So Right to the City emerged in 2007 as a national alliance of membership-led grassroots groups who are fighting for the collective right of poor and working people to define their own living conditions in a way that addresses their needs and the needs of the planet. So that's a little bit about who we are. Next slide. The work that we do is centered around land and housing. 
So in 2013, uh, Right to the City started this national initiative called Homes for All. Um, it's led by our member groups in partnership with other organizations who are fighting to win permanent, dignified, and affordable homes for all people where residents have democratic control over their communities. And we've got over 80 member organizations that are part of Homes for All in over 45 cities and at least 23 states. Um, Ebony, actually, we're not going to, we don't have any interactive slides today. <clears throat> so we're just going to be sharing the slideshow. Um, and people can interact with us through the chat. So that's Homes for All and right to the city. And together we know that we can't win housing justice unless we transform our social and economic systems and unless we win racial, gender, and economic justice for all. So we're building the power of who we call the renter nation because we think that the renter nation has to be part of a broader strategy for building power to bring about a just transition to a world for the people and planet over profit hate and bigotry. And so as a response to this current COVID-19 moment, we launched um, a new campaign, next slide, um, that we're calling Beyond Recovery. So this, this Beyond Recovery campaign, we're calling for a debt-free future and a systemic answer to the crisis, right? Um, you can learn more about our specific demands uh, of, of Beyond Recovery if you go to cancelrent.us and you can sign on there to support the demands as an individual or as an organization. And then we also have national campaign calls every other Wednesday. Um, so the next one is June 3rd and you can register for that. Um, just go through the website and we'll be able to, to connect you with the information about that. Um, so that's us um, and what the, what the work that we're doing is looking like in this current moment. And so as part of the Beyond Recovery campaign, we really wanted to make an offering around understanding what the systemic nature of the crisis is. And so we started this uh, Renner Nation training series. Next slide. So this is today's agenda, what we're going to cover today on why do we pay rent. We're going to learn about how stuff gets made under capitalism and how capitalists become wealthy. We'll talk a little bit about class structure and then we're going to introduce this idea of a just transition for renters. And then we'll close today. This year's training series is working to facilitate the political education and organizing skills of people who have been impacted by this moment to deepen our collective capacity to build intersectional multi-issue movements so that we can develop the strategy and build the power that we need to actually cancel rent and win transformative change. And so, like I said, today's call is why do we pay rent? Land and housing under capitalism. And it's going to focus on how capitalism shapes our housing system. And you can check out the rest of the series topics on our social media or on the same registration link that you use to join today. And we'll be nerding out here every Friday until uh, Juneteenth. Um, so just really quickly, I see there's like new folks on the call and uh, we do this every week, but I just want to get a sense of how people um, heard about this call. So um, we're going to launch a quick poll um, just, just to see how folks were able to connect with us tonight. So if you could take a moment, a poll should have popped up on your screen. If you can take a moment, just fill that out really quickly. Um, it helps us know how we need to reach more people. Cool, about half of us have voted. Three quarters of us. Okay, I think that's, that's good. We can end the poll and uh, we got to 85%. Cool, so yay, you read our emails. <laughs> Um, and some of you are connecting with us on social media oh, and some folks are getting this from word of mouth. 
or email from a different organization. Okay, right on, pass the, pass the word, spread the word um, for next week and the rest of the series, bring more people, bring a friend um, and let's, let's learn about stuff together. All right, so let's dig in. Um, we start every call with a piece that we call culture as a weapon on the next slide. So we believe that culture can be a weapon against oppression, against suffering, against ignorance, against hatred, against isolation and fear, um, because culture nourishes us, right? It, it's food for the body, for the mind, for the soul, and it fortifies us um, for the struggle. It allows us to connect to each other and to the world around us. And it also helps us make meaning of our experience experiences, right? It helps us understand who we are and our place in the world. Um, and we think culture is power and we think that power should be used for our liberation. And so part of culture is humor. And I like to um, share humorous cultural <laughs> references. So today we're going to watch a video um, from Saturday Night Live. And, um, and then we'll talk a little bit about what we saw. Oh, come on, let me know if you want me to do it. I can, I can hit the, the video real quick. Oh, you got it. Oh, but we can't hear it. You got to click the share your computer audio button. All right, so just for a minute, can we um, engage in the chat and if folks could share one or two words about what you noticed or felt or what you related to in the video, um, specifically thinking about paying rent. <laughs> yes, how many other people feel like their, <laughs> their rent is $77,000 a month? <laughs> yes, the audience agreed, yes. The rent is too high, yes. <laughs> yeah, so it was, it was funny because it's true, right? Because we all resonate with how much rent is. Yes, especially in New York, right? Um, and I think it was, it was pointed out earlier this year when we got the $1,200 stimulus check, right? Um, that that doesn't pay for a two bedroom apartment anywhere in the entire country, right? So the rent is too damn high for real and it has real comp uh, consequences, right? Um, it is, it's too high. <laughs> What's funny about that? It has real consequences, right? It, it means that people are not getting what they need to, um, to live. And in this particular moment, we, need, we can't afford to have people not able to live in their homes, right? Not able to stay in their homes. So um, yeah, just wanted to laugh a little bit because we laugh to keep from crying. We laugh to feed ourselves for the struggle. Um, and we laugh also to understand what's at stake, right? Um, and so just wanted to share that. So Let's move on to the next piece. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Maria. Thanks, oh, Paige. You can stop the share for a minute, Kamal. Cool. Um, well, hi, everyone. Like I said, my name is Maria. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm coming from Oakland and I work at the Housing Rights Committee of San Francisco. So, yeah, the rent is too damn high. And tonight's call is taking that a little bit further and asking the questions, 
So why do we pay rent at all? Why do we pay rent? And before we jump in and explore that further, we want to um, have a little bit of an interactive moment. So um, we're asking you all, what do you think the answer to that question is? Why do you pay rent? So put it in the chat. And yeah, why do we pay rent? Why do you pay rent? Yeah, okay, so I'm seeing, seeing some coming in. So we pay rent so we don't get evicted. Yeah, because we're afraid of being homeless by an eviction. You pay rent simply to have a space to live, to save up for your own home, to keep from experiencing homelessness again, because you can't afford to buy a home, so your kids have a roof over their head, Right, there are all of these individual personal reasons why we pay rent. However, it's important to remember that these individual personal reasons happen within the context of a system of the systemic reasons we pay rent. So the other underlying question that we're asking today, why do we pay rent, is actually unearthing two fundamental assertions that we're making. One is that people can't live without the land and all that comes from land. Land is how we get our basic needs met. Land is how we get all of our needs met. And two, that the vast majority of people do not have free access to or ownership slash stewardship of land. Which, there it is, Kelly just said it. Because we don't have control over our basic needs, which is land. One of the assertions we're making is that it's land. So let's get your fingers ready again. We're gonna jump into the chat. I have another question for you all. What does land mean to you? What do you think of when you think of land? Oh, security, home, water and natural, re natural resources, a connection to Mother Earth, land is life, land is sacred, self-determination, community, a home to live. Roots and ground, yeah. Land means a lot of different things to each of us. What sustains us, sustenance. Um, so land means a lot of different things to each of us because land is everything for us. We're land mammals after all. Oh, I'm so sorry y'all, I'm getting a little bit lost. But yes, land is important. We are, we, we need it. Um, but we don't actually own it. Um, under capitalism, the basic need of, of land is actually obscured and land becomes something that you either do or don't own. I'm going to send it back to Paige to tell us more about that. Yeah, thanks Maria and thanks folks for sharing all of those beautiful responses. Um, I'm just really sitting with that and feeling that a lot um, about uh, land and our connection to it and how it has been um, disrupted, right? So I want to explore that a little bit. So we're gonna, I'm going to ask you another question for the chat. <clears throat> Who owns stuff here? If, you're, if you own stuff, what are examples of things that you own? And how did you come to own them? I'll give you an example for me. I own, <laughs> I'm like, what do I own? <laughs> I own a TV. I own some books. I own like some pieces of art. Um, yeah, people are saying my, my bed, my phone, my laptop, my car, right? My dog, <laughs> my soul. Mm -hmm my family. So I own butter. <laughs> yes, Vinny is getting what I'm put, is getting what I'm putting down. So <clears throat> most of the belongings that we own is stuff that we buy. Products, merchandise, property, right? And so all of these words 
can be summed up in one word, commodity. Hey, Linda. <laughs> so um, can we share the screen again, Kamau? Let's define what we mean by commodity. So a commodity, is, very simply put, is something that can be bought or sold for profit. So what are some commodities that we need to live, but we have to pay for? People have already mentioned some of them. What are, what are things that you have to buy in order to live? Food, yep, <laughs> we need food. We have to buy, uh, oh, asthma inhaler, yeah, we gotta buy our medicines and things to take care of ourselves. There are commodities, clothes, to keep ourselves warm, we gotta buy that. Hygienic products, sometimes a car you might need, right? Access to transit mostly, housing, right? So let's look at the, the case of housing specifically. Oh, can we go to the next slide actually? I just wanted to hammer home the, the point that commodities are anything that can be bought and sold, right? So food, um, oil, water, um, plants, apparently air. I learned that you buy the air above your house when you buy a house. Um, it's, it's basically everything that we need to live has been turned into something that can be bought and sold. And so let's look at the, the, the case of housing in particular. Um, so commodities are important to understand because the logic of, of capitalism revolves around the buying and selling of things to turn a profit, right? So in places where before capitalism developed, people didn't make things for profit, make things because we need them, right? We need a place to live, we need shelter, we're gonna build a house. Um, when capitalism develops though, it commodifies things. So it turns things that we need into products to be bought or sold. And the driving um, impetus of, of capitalism is not about meeting our needs as humans, right? It's about how do we more efficiently make more money? And so capitalism doesn't attempt to provide basic necessities to the most vulnerable among us. And that, that's pretty much a guarantee that not all people's needs will be met or even considered, right? And so we, we don't build our houses, just we can't like go out and build a house if we need it, right? We have to go through the market. We have to purchase a product, right? Um, and so, uh, sorry, I'm also getting a little bit lost. Ebony, could you actually take notes at the bottom of the agenda? <laughs> and then they, they won't move, sorry about that. Um, so where am I? Here I am. Okay, so housing. So people don't build their houses anymore. Instead, they buy them. So how does housing get made under capitalism? What do you need to buy uh, to build a house? What does it take to build a house? You can respond in the chat. Permits. Mm -hmm. Raw materials. Land. Labor money, all of that, right? So all of the things that y'all are naming are what we call uh, the means of production. Can we go to the next slide? So we're gonna define this, <clears throat> the means of production. The means of production are things that we use to make things. So land, water, oil, gas, trees, tools, equipment, factories, capital, money, right? Permits, so the means of production. Essentially, the means of production is the way stuff gets made. So all the stuff that you buy, how does it get made? The means of production. Under capitalism, the means of production are owned privately by the wealthy, okay? So you can own a factory, you can own land, you can own an oil field, right? 
all of that is allowed to be privately owned rather than allowing everybody who needs access to it to make stuff that they need, right? So can we go to the next slide? Just to give um, some examples. Oh, I think you need to click a couple of times. Sorry, Kamal. So um, instead of being able to go into the forest and chop down your own tree to make lumber to build your own house, you pay a real estate agent who works for a housing developer who contracted the architect and the construction company which bought the materials from the lumber company that owns the forest land, which is stolen indigenous land, right? And so each person in this scenario either gets a cut or they get cut out, regardless of what anybody actually needs, right? So what we actually need doesn't matter. It's about what's going to make money. So next slide. <clears throat> So when we're talking about land, we're talking about a really important means of production, right? It's a really important way that stuff gets made. It's where we get all of our needs met, right? It's a huge part of how um, things get transported and sold, right? So there's no, no matter what, what type of economic system that we live under, humans are always going to produce things. There's always going, we're always going to need the land. We're always going to need the things that the land provides for us, right? And so there will always be some sort of means of production. But under capitalism, what's unique about it is that the, the means of production are allowed to be privately owned by a few wealthy people, even though all people need them, right? During last week's session, we watched a video of a young Jesse Gray, a housing organizer of the 1963-1964 Harlem rent strikes, talking about the importance of putting people over property, right? And we chant that slogan, people over profit. And we're talking about a world where we're producing things in order to meet people's needs and to allow us to, to develop as humans, right? So I'm gonna pass it over to Maria again, and we're going to learn a little bit about how capitalists accumulate wealth. Thanks. So I'm going to take it all the way back before capitalists reached North America. Hopefully by now folks have come to understand that Christopher Columbus did not discover America and that there were already people here who had been inhabiting this land, these lands, for thousands upon thousands of years prior. Indigenous people were subjected to genocide by European colonists and the survivors were largely forced from their land, which was stolen and appropriated to construct what we know as the United States. This is what we call original accumulation. Um, you might have heard of a term um, private or primitive accumulation, uh, but we recognize the negative stigma attached to the word primitive, which is why we use the word original accumulation. So can we go to the, the next slide? Um, so what does that mean? <laughs> Original accumulation is the first efforts of capitalist institutions to take control of land from indigenous inhabitants. And we'll go more in depth about this process of original accumulation in, the, in next week's sessions on land and housing under racial capitalism. But it's important to understand that genocide is how America's first capital, America's first capitalists established the legal right for the wealthy to privately own land and that which comes from the land. Next slide, please. So one of the primary ways capitalists justify their exploitative system is by calling it, or is by claiming that the unequal patterns of property ownership came about fairly and peacefully through trade. That's the, the story they're starting to tell. Can we go to the next slide? At the heart is the idea, and at the heart of that story is the idea that some people transformed their modest ownership into vast empires through thrift and hard work, whereas others squandered it due to laziness and self-indulgence. It's the same narrative we're told about the poor today. Next slide. In reality, 
capitalism originated out of the violent seizure of land and resources from the feudal lords and peasants in Europe, and by way of even more violent colonization throughout the whole globe. It's a process which continues today as imperialism. Next slide. Um, so between, actually, can we go back one slide, sorry. Um, so there's a story that's starting to get told about how uh, wealth accumulation comes from hard work. Um, and it was told at the beginning, it's still being told now. It evolves, it changes, but at the heart of it, it's the same story. But we know, like it says here in the slide, that that's actually not the reality. Um, so between 1976 and 1887, the United States government seized over 1.5 billion acres from America's indigenous people. Land, as we have already noted, is an important way to make stuff, a key ingredient in the means of production. And once the United States stole this land and commodified it, the wealthy began buying it up and amassing incredible profits. Thank you. Yes, 1976. Um, so now we're going to take a look at a story of one such wealthy American more in detail. Can we go to the next slide? So this is the story of John D. Rockefeller. Or oh, one sorry, Kamal, that's a story. video. Yes. Yeah. And it's a video, yeah? Yeah. Should I share it? Okay, let me share it. Let me open it. So before um, we jump uh, into the video, how is this landing for y'all? Put it in the chat. We just went through a lot of history in like a minute or two. Have you all thought about housing in this way before? I'm saying, yeah. So for folks maybe for, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so some, you know, there's, there's a mix, right? Oh, okay, here's our video. So um, this is a video about John D. Rockefeller. I'm gonna read from the chat a little bit more, maybe not. Thank you all for, for jumping in the chat and being part of uh, this interactive conversation together. Let's watch this video about John D. Rockefeller. I got it, I got it. <laughs> Here it is. In the 19th century, millions crossed the ocean seeking freedom and opportunity. They find a country starkly divided between the haves and the have-nots. Between 1860 and 1900, the richest 2% of American families own one-third of the nation's wealth. These bare-knuckled businessmen rule industry, Wall Street, and Washington. The most powerful of all, oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller the world's first billionaire. His company, Standard Oil, savages and then swallows up its competitors and ends up controlling 90% of the American oil industry. By 1896, he has assets of $200 million, over $5 billion in today's money. Rockefeller and his fellow robber barons are not loved. Ordinary Americans resent their wealth and power. Oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller, his son, John Jr., decide to redeem their public image. John Sr., to win American hearts and minds, publicizes his philanthropy. By now, he has already given away around $150 million. Over four billion today. With his trademark cap, John Sr. appears more often in front of the cameras. Crowds like this one welcoming him at a Florida railroad station 
treat him warmly. The strategy pays off. Americans start to associate the Rockefellers less with ruthless business practices and more with good works. Thanks to film, audiences can now see the lifestyles of the rich and famous. The robber barons become celebrities. Cool. So let's talk about that for a sec. Um, get those fingers ready, jump in that chat. Uh, what did you see in the video about truth versus perception? Why, and then the second question is, why is John D. Rockefeller's reputation important for capitalism? So I'm seeing it, um, constant manipulation. There's a new way of thinking in celebrity. Mm -hmm. So there's like a, a, a story that gets manufactured and then presented out through this new medium. Yeah, propaganda super premeditated and really intentional to justify immense wealth. Yeah, and so the, this kind of sets a precedent for what's allowed, what's capable, it normalizes it. The war whooping, um, it's like watching Richie Rich with my daughter and trying to use it as a teaching moment for getting upset because she likes the movie. Yeah, it happens. But there's, um, there's a way in which these kinds of stories that help hold up and normalize wealth get put in these packages that are really nice, right? So whether it's watching Richie Rich with your kid, which honestly, I love that movie as a kid as well. <laughs> it's actually really fun. Um, or um, all the other ways in which media is, is set up to, to kind of normalize this. We, we get fed this ideological framework, this narrative, that um, it's all about bootstraps, right? If somebody wants it hard enough, they can do it. People are self-made, it's all about individualism. Um, and then the other part that I think is in, um, so, uh, and so that's part of it, right? And then the other question is, um, so the, why is uh, John D. Rockefeller's reputation important for capitalism? Why do you all think they went through all this trouble to use this new medium like movies um, and give away all this charity, all this money? Um, why, why did you all think they did that? Why is that important for the maintaining of capitalism? To justify it as something good, faux philanthropy? Mm. So yeah, to, to really, hone in on this possibility that we are all just waiting to be billionaires, right? If it's an individual state, it's about something that you can do yourself. Yeah, maintains people investment in the myth. Yeah, it creates this possibility of, well, we're, we can all do it. So the nor it, it normalizes this mass accumulation of wealth, this individualizing of profit um, versus and, and, and even the, the charity part, even the part that is about sharing and resources, it's still about an individual's um, kind of stance in that, right? It's not collectively owned. There aren't a ton of questions asked about how did he get all that money in the first place? What happened to those resources? Why does it have to be mediated through him that we get them back? All that kind of stuff. Yeah. Manipul uh, manipulating the people being generous, quote unquote, yeah. So, um, and it, it all kind of goes back, right? So if we can think about the slides before that we're saying that um, this, this accumulation of wealth, even the original, the original accumulation um, was justified as being fair and on a basis of equal trade. And that if people aren't wealthy, it's because they're not working hard enough. It's a continued um, it's a continued story. And like I said, it gets changed. Um, it changes for different audiences in different times. Um, but there, but it's at the heart of it, it's still a way to uphold the normalization of accumulation of wealth and to not ask too many questions about where all that wealth come, came from. So I kind of already said it, but um, do y'all think there's something missing in the Rockefeller story? 
Um, can we go to slide 19? Um, yeah, so part of what's missing from Rockefeller's story is how that all happened, right? How did um, all of this even make it? How, how is it possible that one person, one individual, can make amass all of this money? Because we know, we know it's not just through hard work. I know some of the hardest working people, and they're not billionaires. We're all hardworking people. That's not how wealth is accumulated. We know that. So what, what doesn't get said in this story that normalizes wealth and accumulation is that John D. Rockefeller, amongst other capitalists, benefit from a world where A, land has already been forcibly taken by the United States, right? So original accumulation, there's already a framework set up for more accumulation, more privatization, more um, monopolizing of resources into smaller and smaller groups of people. Two, that land is something to be bought and sold. It's a commodity. Before, you know, it's not that long ago, it feels like a long time, but it's not that long ago that land was something that we were in interrelationship with. It wasn't something that got bought and sold. And so creating land as a commodity is actually a really important step in being able to um, justify wealth accumulation through land and housing. And the third one is that privately owning land, oil, and oil refineries and other forms of means of production is considered normal. Again, similarly to land, it wasn't that long ago that if you needed resources to meet your basic needs, they were available. Um, and they were usually available in collectives. Um, and so being, and so again, privatizing the means of production, like creating land as a commodity, is uh, are all kind of the foundations that make this level of wealth accumulation even possible. So he didn't do it on his own. Um, okay, so what happened to John D. Rockefeller? Well, we already saw some of it, right? So he's got a big old part of New York named after him and his family. Um, and so something must have happened with his wealth. It didn't just disappear and he didn't give it all away. <laughs> um, so in 1921, if we can go to the next slide, and this is the one where you have to kind of click. So, um, so in 1921, John D. Rockefeller's son, John D. Rockefeller Jr., John Jr., they called him, received about 10% of the shares of the Equitable Trust Company from his father, making him the bank's largest shareholder. First click. Subsequently, in 1930, Equitable merged with Chase uh, the Chase National Bank, making Chase the largest bank in the world at the time. Although his stock holding was reduced to about 4% following this merger, he was still the largest shareholder in what became known as the quote unquote Rockefeller Bank. Um, and then as late as the 1960s, the family still retained about 1% of the bank's shares, by which time his son, John Jr.'s son David, had become the bank's president. So we're gonna fast forward um, to right after the financial crisis of 2008. Chase Manhattan Bank was the fourth largest owner of foreclosed properties in the US overall. And if you just look at private banks, Chase had the third largest inventory of foreclosed properties of all of the banks after Bank of America and Wells Fargo, who remember standing outside of a Chase trying to fight for your neighbor's home. I do. <laughs> so. We have, so we've come full circle, right? From forcing original native inhabitants from their lands to repossessing foreclosed homes from working people, we see the same fundamental contradictions of land and housing under capitalism. The fact that people do not have control over the land and housing and that land and housing remains in the control of the capitalist class in the forms of corporations like Chase Bank with the support of the United States government. So when I first learned this, that like John D. Rockefeller was also the people behind Chase, it blew my mind. So again, we're sharing a lot, but I'll pass it back to Paige. We're hearing from people in Dominic. So bad that federal government 
actually did spin and to now we're legal, right? Trying to do some sort of regulation. But um, we saw last week going through some of the history of the housing movement that um, when um, um, I digress to talk more about this idea of um, Um, a Rockefeller, right? Why is Jeff Bezos allowed to become a trillionaire? You know, um, so we've talked about commodities, we've talked about the means of production, we've talked about original accumulation. Oh, can you all hear me? Oh, damn. Can you all hear me? Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes and no. I'm getting yes and no. Okay. <laughs> um, hopefully it'll stay good. Okay. So we've talked about commodities. We've talked about the means of production and we've talked about original accumulation. Um, so capitalism turns basic needs into products to be bought and sold, right? Capitalism allows for the private ownership of the things that we need to make those products, particularly land. And capitalism started by stealing indigenous land through violence. And the way that we all experience capitalism is through the class structure of our society. So let's dig into what we mean when we talk about class. Next slide. So class structure. Class structure is the organization and the relationships of the different social groups in a capitalist society based on their role in the economy. And we're gonna break this down a little bit, but I think what's important to understand is that there is a structure, right, that categorizes people into class and it depends on how they have access to the means of production or not. Next slide. So one class um, is the bourgeoisie, also known as the ruling class or the owning class or the 1%, right? So the bourgeoisie class owns the means of production. They own all the resources and the technology that we need to run the economy. They own the land, they own factories, raw materials, and so on. <laughs> This class also owns the means of production, uh, I'm sorry, the means of distribution, right? So the trucks, the airlines, et cetera. And they work with this federal government to have access to the infrastructure to move their goods, right? They're the people who employ and exploit uh, middle and working class people to gain a profit. Oh, and I missed one thing. They also own the means of communication. Right, so newspapers, television stations, right, the corporate media. So this is the bourgeoisie class. These are the folks on top. These are very few in number, right, that belong to the bourgeoisie. Next slide. Okay, then we have something called uh, the petite bourgeoisie or the middle class. And I think this is one that most folks are, are more familiar with, right? Hearing this term middle class. So the middle class owns enough property to survive without having to work for someone else, but not enough to exploit other people on a large scale, right? So this class, so, so they might have a corner, they might be corner store owners, have small businesses, Right. They also include uh, people who have professional jobs like lawyers, doctors, teachers, academics, that kind. Right. So that's what we consider um, the petite bourgeois or the middle class. So people who basically help the bourgeoisie manage capitalism. OK, next one. So then we've got the proletariat also known as the working class or rank and file, right, in labor. 
So the working class is made up of people who don't own any independent way to survive, right? They don't own the means of production. They don't own land. They don't own raw materials. They've got to buy or rent everything to survive. They work for other people who do own some means of production to earn wages to survive, right? So the working class. Then lastly, next slide. There's the lumpen proletariat, also known as the underclass. So this, these are folks who are excluded or locked out of the formal economy. So usually these are people who are not making formal wages. This class includes people who are permanently unemployed or underemployed, those who survive through work in the underground economy, and those who are part of the informal economy and people who get by on, on government assistance. And just a, a fact about this little image here, this is actually a um, Black Panther Party publication. The Black Panthers tried to organize the lumpen proletariat, right? Because so many, um, so many Black folks are part of the lumpen proletariat because we are, you know, consistently unemployed and locked out of formal, the formal economy because of discrimination and bias, right? So there's these four classes are kind of the big four under a capitalist society. Can we go to the next slide? So there's other things that um, you should take into consideration when thinking about class in the United States, really anywhere. Um, it's a use, class is a useful framework when it comes to understanding our power and our organizing work, but there's also important additional factors to consider like class consciousness, right? So the class, the class structure in the United States is more complicated than owning and working class, right? Um, there's a large middle class in the United States. And then beyond that, there's also many working class people in the United States who identify as middle class, right? Um, because the capitalists have been able to sort of market the idea of middle class being somebody who achieves the American dream, right? Um, oh, I own my own home. Even if I'm like going to be paying off that mortgage for 30 years, I'm middle class. Right, even though I don't have my own business and I have to look for other people to work for, I'm middle class, right? And so there's like a class consciousness aspect when we're talking about class in the US to take into consideration. Then there's race and national oppression. So the working class in the US is fractured along racial lines, right? Class is actually largely experienced as race in this country. There's a racial division of labor in the US, right? So just thinking about like a restaurant, for example, who is the server who works in the front of the house? They're usually young and white, right? Who are the folks who work in the back of the house in the kitchen? They're usually black and brown people, right? And so class is experienced as race and white working class people have gotten material and social privileges in the US. Even if they're even if they're working part of the working class, right? And then there's also gender and sexuality to take into consideration. The oppression of women and queer people and trans people means that there are dynamics of privilege and oppression that play out within oppressed classes. So there's a gender division of labor in the workplace and in our homes, right? Like who raises the children? It's mostly women doing that kind of work. Right, and, and, and then also just like think about jobs that are heavily gendered, like healthcare workers, mostly women, construction workers, mostly men, you know, so thinking also about gender and sexuality. And then there's imperialism, right? US imperialism, so meaning that the US trying to expand its influence all over the world has led to a material privileging of workers in the US at the expense of workers in the global south, right? So this impacts our consciousness for everybody in the United States, including working class people and people of color, right? So even though workers of color in the United States are treated terribly, 
the things that they are that do that they do have access to come at the expense of people in other countries in poor countries in black and brown countries and so what does that mean for you know the role of us workers in the international struggle what role do we have to play right we're not going to get into that tonight although it's really juicy conversation but just wanted to to complicate a little bit the framework of class and so um actually can we go back one slide come on so there's class and then there's class position so class position is the concrete material position that each class each social group occupies in society based on their relationship to the economy right so it's a description of where you actually stand not where you think you stand so you might think that you're middle class right but your actual relationship to the means of production or your actual engagement in the economy is going to actually determine your class position so I do want to just get in really quick with y'all about why you think so many people identify as middle class. What's going on there? Let's talk about it in the chat. American conformity. Mm. Respectability. Internalized oppression. Mm. These are some like heavy concepts, y'all. We wanna think we're closer to the top than we are. Yeah, it's a false narrative. Even rich people claim to be middle class. Right, right. Even the wealthy think that they're not wealthy enough. <laughs> Divide and conquer, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's part of the capitalist propaganda. It's, it's, it's stigmatized to see yourself as working class, right? It's, it's like not, um, it's not something to be proud of, right? Yeah, the shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we desire a, a false uh, type of life, right? And there isn't a lot of negative narrative around the middle class, it's true. It's like, oh, middle class, you're fine, right? Like you're worthy. You deserve rights if you're middle class. You're not like, yeah, you're respectable, right? Yeah, education has a lot to do with it as well. And if you see on this little graphic, you see people trying to climb to the top through study, right? They've got their school books and their backpacks, right? They're trying to use education to get up to the ruling class, but they get knocked down, right? Because the class structure is not changing. The idea that you can um, pull yourself up by your bootstraps is a lie right this is actually how the economy is structured and it's not meant for you to to move up right but it is meant for us to think that we can move up right cool uh next slide so class interest Class interest is the fundamental interest that each group has in changing the socioeconomic and political system based on their role in the economy. So basically, the class interest is whether or not you would materially benefit from having the status quo change or stay the same, right? If you want things to change, it means that there's a, if your class interest is, is within the working class or the lump and proletariat you have an interest in changing the status quo right because right now you don't have access to the means of production you depend completely on the wealthy right so yeah so this is um trying to get at at what what understanding what each class cares about right it all interests for the working class what does the working class gain from the status quo, if anything. Nothing. <laughs> Exhaustion. <laughs> yes. All we get is hurt and heartbreak and pain and suffering. You know, like even the highest paid tech worker, right, is still working class because if that tech company goes under, what does that tech worker have? Right? Do they own anything? Do they have any sense of power, sort of power, right? 
medical bills, debt, right? Yeah. So it's important to understand where, where we are in the class structure. It's also important to understand what our class interests are. And it's important to be able to um, understand our enemies' class interests, right? So that we can actually leverage power against them, right? Okay, so we're just gonna take a quick poll um, to help us try and, and understand our own class position and interest. Um, so can we do poll number three? Cool, so just take a couple of minutes and um, answer these few questions, yes or no. And we'll see. Can people see the poll? Okay. Okay, there it goes. It's loading now. I see a third of us have voted. All right, half of us. We'll just do another minute. Uh, the, for question number one, it's either one, if you pay rent or if you pay a mortgage, yes or no. All right, there might be some technical difficulties for some of you with the poll, I'm sorry about that. It's been a little glitchy recently. But let's go ahead and um, end the poll and share. We got three quarters of us to participate. So the majority of us on the, on the call are paying a rent or a mortgage. So on the, I think it was the first or the second call, we defined the renter nation as including people who pay um, a mortgage because we consider mortgage holders like bank tenants, right? If you miss a payment on your mortgage, foreclosure, right? You know, you don't actually fully control your housing or your or the land where you live if you're paying a mortgage. So that's a majority of us on the call. Um, you're paying more than 30% of your income. We've got 63% uh, of respondents that said yes, and we know that that's true for most Americans. Um, you have faced the, the threat of eviction or foreclosure. Um, over half of people who responded said no, but 43% of us have, right, have faced the threat of eviction or foreclosure. If you've lived in a home with mold or no hot water or rodents or other unhealthy conditions, Right, 63% of us have lived in, um, in homes without healthy conditions. There's a lot of new development and real estate speculation, 86% of us, right? We're seeing our communities change all over the country. If you've been angered by the way you or others in your community have been treated, 96%, almost all of people who responded, right? Because we're seeing what happens to people in, um, who are not part of the bourgeoisie, right? We're seeing what happens to working class people, to black and brown people um, when it comes to land and when it comes to housing. Cool, thanks y'all for participating in the poll. Um, just gonna do a quick time check, where are we? Oh, we're good. Okay, so I'm gonna pass it over to Maria um, for this last section. Well, thanks. So we've covered a lot. Um, and I just want to remind us that throughout history, land has not always been treated as a commodity. People have collectively owned some or all of the means of production. And the original inhabitants of this land have continued to resist their displacement and the commodification of Mother Earth's abundance. A lot of us are in deep allyship and relationship to folks who have um, continued to, to do that work. 
And so for us as the renter nation, we must also resist and struggle for a new reality. Can I get the next slide? So here at Homes for All, we believe in a just transition for the renter nation. So um, this is a visual that some of you um, might have, you might have seen it at some place before. Um, and just like uh, the Just Transitions framework from moving us from an extractive economy to a regenerative economy, uh, our Just Transitions framework to move us from an unjust housing system to a just housing system recognizes that a transition is going to happen. And I think for many of us living in these times, it's even clear that transitions are all around us, whether they come in forms of crisis or whether they come in forms of transition that we move, it's up to us, right? So one of the things that I really love about Just Transitions Frameworks is that they hold that complexity. Transitions will happen. Whether they are just or not is up to us, which is why we're all here. That's why we're building the, the renter nation. So um, if we're looking at the system we currently have under capitalism, the stuff on the left side of your screen, the unjust housing system stuff, um, it's what we all know. It's what we all live. It's what we, a lot of us are fighting against. Um, and it's a system where homelessness is the result of treating housing as a commodity for profit. And it's considered normal. It's considered normal to have people who can't afford, quote unquote, a basic human need. Society accepts that some people live without homes, even when there is more than enough housing for everyone. I live in a neighborhood that has a lot of new luxury development. It's also a neighborhood where I see my unhoused neighbors walking around and I can literally point to apartments where they could move into and they, the city doesn't. Right now in many of our cities, for us here in the Bay Area, there are empty hotel rooms, another form of a roof that our unhoused neighbors could actually have, get off the streets, be able to stay safe from this pandemic. It hasn't happened yet. So we live in a world where it's not just normalized, but it's upheld, that it's okay for people to not have a roof, even when there's more than enough to go around. And shelters, even, even you know, the hotels um, are still temporary and don't meet our long-term needs for housing and community. We also have um, mortgaged homes, uh, which under capitalism, um, which still exist under the capitalist view of housing um, because it's a commodity for profit, right? So there's a little circle there that says housing for, for profit. Um, so people spend their whole lives trying to pay off a debt to own, quote unquote, own a home because they believe in the American dream. We've been talking about it a lot throughout this call. In the end, the banks and the government exert more control over the land and housing than the homeowner ever will. And we heard a, a little bit about what it's like to live under these conditions from our compa Ranel um, at last week's call for folks who were here. Uh, looking at this system, and so, you know, that's kind of what, what we're under, right? So there's, what else is it is, is under an unjust housing system? There's mass evictions, there's skyrocketing rents, the rent is still too damn high. <laughs> There's gentrification, 86% of us live in neighborhoods or cities where we're seeing all of this new construction, all of this new development. That's one of the factors of gentrification um, and wealth and power concentrated in corporate landlords. So as we move towards building just housing systems, building the alternatives we wanna see, um, we are looking at a system where homes are for people. What a radical idea. It's so hard to even say homes are for people, um, not for profit. And land and housing are democratically controlled by people and land isn't a commodity. Public housing also, uh, should also not be a commodity in, under the housing market and is one way that we can get our housing needs met permanently or uh, permanent housing, affordable housing needs met. However, it's under attack by wealthy private capitalist interest, which many of us know, all of us who do public and subsidized housing work, we know how hard um, and how attacked this form of housing is. Um, and since the federal government owns it, we have to do the double work of holding them accountable to fully fund it and also nationalize more housing, bring more housing out of the speculative market. And so we have to take action to realize our rights to democratically control public housing, because after all, we are the public. 
Um, and then another part of our just housing system model is community land trusts, um, which represent a way for people to collectively control land via nonprofit organizations. If we get CLTs, then we can ensure that what goes on the land, for example, the types of housing, best meet our needs. And this is an option that can bring us closest to collectively owning the means of production. Um, we're going to talk about more about community land trusts and alternative models of land and housing in future sessions. So be sure to stay tuned. Um, and I have a little bit of time, so I'm going to engage the chat. Um, so for folks who are not seeing this for the first time, uh, what are the ways in which you all have thought about this Homes for All strategy to win, this just transition model for housing, just transition for renters from an unjust housing system to a just housing system? How have you brought this into your, your work or your organizing? For folks who have seen it already, for folks who haven't seen it, I'll ask you your question in a second. The question is, for folks who have seen this model, um, what are the ways in which you've been bringing this kind of just transitions, moving us from an unjust system of housing to a just system of housing into your work? Share it in the chat. Um, and for folks who haven't seen this model before, um, what is it making you think about? What are kind of your first reflections or reactions if this is the first time you've seen this? So there's a question, uh, oh, all the chat comes in at once, all of a sudden it gets so overwhelmed. Um, so yes, alternative models of ownership, alternative models of lending, um, rent reductions in buildings without full repairs in order to build community and housing complexes. Yeah, that's some of the ways that folks have been doing this work. Um, yeah, and then for folks who are maybe seeing it for the first time, it's the, the reason for Linda, um, I'm just going to call you out, Linda, because that is making my heart grow like four or five. Um, yeah, it's by four or five times that this model is part of the reason why um, you wanted to join Homes for All. That's super wonderful. And it's also hard, right? Part of what we saw before was that um, these stories are so ingrained into how our society works that it is really hard to think, well, how am I going to talk to people who's, like Paige was saying, whose class interest is against this model? There's quite, yeah, cooperative ownership. I'm seeing some, some stuff resonating from the just housing system model. There's, there's little ways and big ways, too, that we try and bring this into our lived realities where we're, um, this this model kind of shows it a little linearly, but it is something that is, is happening both and, right? So like we live under an unjust housing system and we're also building alternatives at the same time. And I'm seeing a lot of really cool stuff happening in the chat around people sharing, doing a little bit of organizer exchange. I have some concerns about how to talk to people. There's some stuff going on around how others have done it that's beautiful. Yeah, and then there's some folks for whom this is a really big topic and just starting at the idea of why we pay rent is really important, right? It's the first step in thinking, wow, there can be an alternative. So thank you, Hannah, for, for sharing and bringing that up. That's super important. That's part of why we're having these sessions, right? Because we want to um, be able to bring folks into this conversation wherever it is that you're at. Yeah. And the last part is there's a lot of pessimism. And we're trying to motivate folks who feel like it won't work is really, is really hard work and actually central to a lot of the work that we do. Um, there's this concept around imagination that I hold really dear to my heart as, as an organizer and someone who supports other organizers in thinking like, that's what we need, right? So much capitalism takes so much from us. It doesn't just take out our, our ability to own the means of production and sustain ourselves collectively and individually and away from having to um, pay uh, or, or, or sell our, our, our labor. But 
capitalism also takes away our ability to see possibilities and see futures that are not in the way that we're living now. Um, it, and, and for me, being able to see a new future, being able to think about possibilities is really connected to re 